Apache Groovy Meta Programming. So we can skip this one. So my name is Andrew Salmarai, and I love open source. And uh, that's one of the reasons why I'm here. And uh, I discovered the Groovy Programming language back in 2006, if I'm not mistaken. And I joined the, uh, the development team in that year after. So it's been close to 14 years now working with Groovy. And uh, so you're bound to find some stuff as time passes by. Now, I'm quite excited to say that just yesterday, we had three brand new releases. So 307, 2514, and 2421 are finally available for you to test out. And I have in parentheses Alpha 2.0 version 4X because we're currently voting on this release and it's likely to come out either today or during the weekend. Now it's important to remark that uh, Groovy 4 will break binary compatibility. We are changing the namespaces and the packages. We're sadly saying finally uh, goodbye to the Oracle Codehouse Groovy packages. And we are finally transitioning to Org Apache Groovy. So be very careful when testing these binaries. And we certainly encourage you to give us all the appropriate feedback because we want to make uh, Groovy 4 the best release so far. Okay, so Groovy metaprogramming. What is metaprogramming? If you ask the Wikipedia, then you get uh, this answer. It's basically the option for a program to treat code as if it was data. In this way, a program can modify itself. So in the case of Groovy, you can think of adding new properties or removing properties. You can add, remove methods. You can even create new classes out of thin air and start using them. Now, um, in the case of Groovy, there are two types of metaprogramming. There is a compile time metaprogramming and there's a runtime metaprogramming. And if you're familiar with metrics, yeah, the blue pill is where you stay in Wonderland. And um, that is that if you use the Groovy runtime, then everything that you have access to, all the dynamic features and all the additions of the metaprogramming must happen while you're running Groovy code. But in the case of compile time, then you can mix these metaprogramming techniques with other JVM languages. So we're going to explore both of them. And we're going to start with the easiest one, which is the, the runtime version. Okay, for runtime metaprogramming, this is the, uh, the option that has existed for pretty much since the beginning of Groovy, uh, which has started uh, in early 2004, I want to say, if it's not 2003. We need to talk about the Groovy map. And it's not the thing that we use to clean our floors. Actually, MOB stands for Meta Object Protocol. And I'm going to simplify things a lot, but basically you can think of that for every class that exists in the, in the Groovy space or the Groovy runtime, there is a companion meta class. And this is true also for every Java class, for every class that comes from the standard Java library, or for every class that comes from any other JVM language. Groovy will always give you access to a companion meta class. So what the meta object protocol does for you is that when you invoke a method, or in this case, we'll just call it, uh, when you provide a message to a receiver, and the message could be a method, a property getter, a property setter, then the meta object protocol says, hold on a second. So I know that you want to ask this message to a specific class, let's say the Java line string class. But before the Java line string class can reply, I, as a meta object protocol, I'm going to ask the companion meta class, see if the meta class has additional behavior that can react to that particular message. And if that's the case, then the behavior is provided by the meta class instead of the actual class. So it's, there is a one step in between, there is one extraction before the caller sends the message to the actual receiver, and that's the meta object protocol. There are many different ways that we can interact with the meta object protocol, but the meta class perhaps is the, uh, is the most direct one. Now, any modifications that we use, that we make through the meta class are only visible to Groovy while you're running Groovy code. So let's have a very simple example here. Um, <clears throat> let's enhance a Groovy class. So we define a class uh, named person. It has a simple property. You know that the Groovy compiler will generate getters and setters. It will inspect the bytecode. We will see that. That's not our playing field. And then in lines five to seven, what we do is we access the meta class for this person. 
and we define a new method named GRID, and we use a closure, if you think in Lambda terms from Java, well, that's a Lambda expression. And what we're saying here is we pass a string that can have a value, a variable interpolation. So the S argument will be um, replaced with the, uh, the given value and the dollar sign name will be replaced with the given value of the main property for our object. Okay, so now we create an instance of person uh, using one of the group constructors. And then notice that in line 10, we can call the grid method. And if you run this code in a Groovy shell or the Groovy console or anywhere that we can run Groovy, then you get a similar output like this. Now, you may be thinking, well, yes, yeah, this is easy. I mean, it's Groovy code, so it's bound to work. It's a Groovy class. Yeah, sure, it should work. We can do the same thing for Java classes. Even for the standard Java library classes like Java line string. So it's exactly the same thing. We grab hold of the meta class property for every class. And then now we're adding a new method called SpongeBob following the meme. And this thing, what it's going to do is uppercase and down on lowercase the input. And uh, when we invoke the SpongeBob method on a string, and notice that in Groovy, you can use double quotes for a string, or you can also use single quotes for a string. The difference is single quotes is an immutable string whereas double quotes allow you to interpolate values. Now, when we bug the method of SpongeBob, then we get a similar output like that. And notice that we can change Groovy code and we can change Java classes. And this is great. Now, like many things that, that Groovy has done throughout the years, uh, he has taken inspiration from all the languages. And one of those early languages that many people regard with, with a lot of praise is Smalltalk. It's been said that a small talk had only two keywords and everything else was just made up. And one of the reasons that these things could work is that small talk had a feature called does not understand. What is does not understand? So you say you have an instance of something, a particular type, and then you send a message to this particular receiver. And the message, the method is not defined on that particular type. So you'll expect some sort of error, some exception if you were Java. But in the case of small talk, it will still give you one choice. The choice is if there was a method with a specific signature, uh, then it will route all those in incoming messages that were not able to be understood by the type. In the case of Groovy, this is called method missing. If you use that particular signature in a Groovy on a Java class, then you can catch anything that the type does not understand. So let's see, we have a class foo that has no properties and no methods other than the method missing one. And then when we create an instance of foo and we invoke a method, let's say the method say with the argument groovy, then we get that particular printout. That's how we can tell that our method missing implementation, our version of does not understand was actually handled by our class. If, it's, if it works for methods, it should work for properties as well, because properties are just one specific convention for methods, isn't it? It's a getter and a setter. Well, it turns out that we can do the same thing. Uh, we can have a does not understand for properties. There is one version for the setter, which is the first, and there is one version for the getter, which is the second signature. Then we create an instance of foo, and in the line 12, we grab the value of the property ID, which does not exist, and we get the, the first printout. And then in line 13, we try to set the value of property length. And again, this property does not exist, and we get the printout in line 16. So in order to take advantage of the does not understand feature provided by Groovy, you have to follow these method signatures. And you can define these method signatures either in Groovy classes or Java classes. Again, the restriction is you must be running in the Groovy runtime. Here's another thing. Say that we want to have a certain behavior that is only available on a specific scope. These are called categories. Categories require two things. It's an idiomatic convention of how we write the class and the, the methods belonging to the category and how we consume the category. So lines one to five, we get a simple class that has static method. And the first type, the first argument of that method is going to be the receiver, is going to be the type 
that gets the new method. In this case, the Java land string will get that greet method. And the second aspect is the, the, um, the context, the, uh, where we use, or the scope actually, where we use the category lines seven to nine. We use the use method with the greeter type. In Groovy, you can have class literals without the dot class as we do in Java. But if you want, you can also use dot class. It's within that particular scope, line seven to nine, that we can make use of the grid method. If we were to use grid outside of that scope, we will get a runtime exception because the method does not exist. Now, notice that because the convention, the, the idiomatic settings for writing a, a, a category are that it has to be a static method with at least one argument. We can reuse many of the existing Java classes that are available as utility methods or utility types, like this one. Common Slang provides Java Lang string utils. It's a bunch of static methods that take a string as the first argument or maybe it's a char sequence, whatever it is. We can use that class as is without any changes, without any modifications, as if we were a groovy category. The only thing that we need to do is apply it within a particular scope. So basically categories, you must follow um, um, coding convention. You know, the methods must be static and the first type of the argument becomes the receiver. So it's up to you to decide if it's a very specific type like a string, or if you wanna make it a little bit higher like char sequence, or maybe you want to do it all the way to object. It depends on your particular use case. Here's another one, mixins. Mixins can be, as we're seeing here, we can reuse the string utils or we can define a greater class just like we did before, like in a category. But instead of using the, the, the user scope, notice in line 10, we are mixing these types into the Java land string type. After this line, we can invoke all the methods provided by these categories or mixings. There is no scope after this. It's always, it's finally available to all the, uh, all your project or your application while it's running after line number 10. So the advantage of mixings is that you are not limited by the scope, though you have to write mixings like you do with categories. And again, it applies for both Groovy and Java classes. Next, we're gonna do, we're gonna see traits. Uh, traits were added, uh, I want to say it was back in Groovy 1.7, if I'm not mistaken, that's about 2008, if not a bit later. So it's been like 12 years already. Basically traits are like what we have in Java 8 default methods, except that Java 8 are uh, stateless traits. Whereas traits in Groovy, they can be a stateful. And that's exactly what I'm doing here. Let's define a simple interface name provider with just one name. This interface could be defined in Java if you want to. Then we define a trait that implements a state interface and have as a property. And because we know how the Groovy compiler works, that will generate a getter and a setter with that matching field. And then we create a, inst a type person that implements the trait. Then we have a method that is completely unrelated to person. This is a script. And finally, we create an instance of person using the Groovy constructor. And notice that we passed an instance of that person to the grid method. And it just works because the person now has a state and that state is provided by the trait. So if you are missing a stateful traits from Java, well, you can get them in Groovy. And the final change that we're going to showcase for uh, Groovy runtime before we move, we move into Cobalt time are the extension modules. They work like mixings in the sense that they can provide any additional methods that you want or properties, but they are always globally available. You can modify Groovy and Java classes as we have seen in the past. You can provide instance and static methods. Uh, so far, we have seen only instance methods. They can be type checked by the compiler. If you didn't know, Groovy is both dynamic type and a statically type. You can have it type checked and still run it dynamic in runtime, or you can have it compile static and turn those 
warning errors into actual compiler errors. So Groovy has it all. It has dynamic typing and has static typing. And extension modules are gain the benefit of the static compilation as well. So you can tell pretty right away if something is not working properly with your extension module. You need the code that provides the behavior, of course, but you also need one additional resource that is the hint for the compiler to uh, inject the extensions into the proper location. So say, for example, we want to create an extension like this that provides the vcrypt um, uh, encrypting algorithm to a string. Now, this code looks like Java. It can certainly be Java, but it's also valid Groovy code. And that's one of the reasons why I prefer Groovy over other JVM languages is because the way that you write Groovy code is pretty much the same way as you write Java code if you need it. Of course, you can write it idiomatic if you want to. So we have two methods here. And the receiver type is a string. And uh, that's pretty much it. The next thing that we need to do is the resource. This is how the compiler can find out what to do with your extension module. So you have to add content to a particular file called Oracle has Groovy Runtime Extension Module. And beware what I said earlier, this file name will change in Groovy 4 because now it will be uh, Oracle Apache Groovy Runtime Extension Module. The content of this file has to have at least three elements, the name of the module, the number of the module. So these two things, uh, these two values are up are to you to control in any way you deem fit. And then a comma separated list of fully qualified class names providing the extensions. The bcrypt extension that we wrote is supposed to be used as extension module. So we pass it as an extension classes uh, property here. If we were to provide a static extensions, then we use the, the four line. And again, that's a comma separated full qualified class names. So once you have these two things in the class path, the bigquery extension class and this extension module file, then your code can just invoke and code as bigquery of any string that you want, as if it were a method existing in the Java line string class. And remember, that this addition will be type checked by the compiler. These additions are also visible to IDEs and code completion. Okay, so we're done with the runtime aspect. Let's move into the compile time aspect. So compile time gives you pretty much the benefits that we saw at runtime. So you can add and remove methods, add and remove properties, even create new classes. But the advantage is that instead of relying on the meta object protocol at runtime, now all these additions, all these changes will be reflected in the bytecode, in the generated bytecode. That means any Groovy class can have access to those modifications, but any Java classes or any other alternate JVM language that just happens to load the bytecode will also see the changes. And that's why compile time um, metaprogramming is so important because it opens the door for Groovy to interact with the whole JVM ecosystem, not just one language, but all of them. And all these modifications can also be type checked by the compiler. So the static compilation will also benefit from, uh, from all these additions. How do we make this work? Well, the secret sauce for compile time metaprogramming is a little thing called ASD transformations. And ASD stands for abstract syntax tree. This is an in-memory representation of your program. So you have something that there's a compilation session and there is a module that can contain classes and that well, actually is a class node and a class node can contain uh, method nodes and property nodes and the methods contain statements and the statements are comprised of other statements and expressions. So you get a hierarchy of everything representing your code. There are two flavors of AST transformations. There are the local flavor and the global flavor. <clears throat> it's likely that you have seen Groovy code before that you have encountered local transformations. They are quite visible. Whereas the global transformations are always sitting in the background. They are uh, not very easy to spot, but you can tell if they are doing some work. 
If you want to implement your own ASC transformations, you have to be aware of some of the compiler APIs and you have to know, understand the AST hierarchy, the group internals, and a few other things. So it's a little bit of dark magic, but it's quite fun. But I have to warn you, if you really want to get into this, uh, it's you go down the rabbit hole. Uh, look at this mirror. I've been doing ST transformations for 14 years and I just can't get out. I just like changing code on the fly. So, local AC transformations. You require two types. A hint for the compiler to say, this is where the, I want you to do something extra. This is typically done with an interface. That's the entry point. And the actual implementation of the changing behavior. This is the actual AST transformation that you want to have. So Groovy ships with a bunch of AST transformations, both local and global. Uh, two string is probably one of the most typical ones. Uh, so this is how we consume the two string AST transformation, supplied to a type. And when we create an instance of this person and we print it out, Notice that it prints the name of the class or the type of the class and the values of all the properties. You, if you want, you can customize this by passing additional parameters to a string to print out the names of the properties. You could also exclude or include any properties. You can change a few things. Now, again, this is how you consume. If you were to define something like this, you need to have an annotation. The annotation name is to a string, could be anything you want. It's just like any regular annotation that you find out there. You can even write it in Java if you want to. Except that on line four, there is, that is the link with this, uh, with this entry point, the to a string in, interface or annotation into the actual ASD transformation. It's thanks to that particular link that the compiler knows whenever it encounters an annotated element with to a string, it will invoke the code provided by the two string AST transformation type. The implementation of that type must implement the AST transformation uh, interface or could extend from Axar AST transformation, which gives you access to this visit method. The nodes that you are that you are given are the annotation and the annotated thing, which could be a class node a method node, a property node, or something else, depending on what the annotation can annotate. And from then on, then you can move through the AST hierarchy and add or remove nodes. The other interesting thing that needs to happen is that we need to tell the compiler in which phase we want this transformation to be applied. Because the Groovy compiler works in nine phases, which is done by, uh, you can see the enum compile phase. Now, canonicalization, I believe, is phase number five or six, I think. And is this time at this time that your class has all the ties have been resolved, your class is pretty well formed, and it's the right time for you to make any additions or any subtractions. If you were to do this in previous phases, some of the inputs or some of the types may not be fully resolved, and there are transformations that rely on that fact. And if you were to do this later, then your code will be pretty much already set on the stun and it's already too late. So canonicalization is the right time to do any modifications to the bytecode. Here's another typical AST transformation, canonical. Canonical is actually a meta AST transformation because it applies the two string, tuple constructor, equals and hash code, and a few others. So uh, this is just like you apply a, a single transformation, or at least you see in the code is just one line, but you get a lot of behavior out of that because it applies everything else for you. Remember our frame category from a few slides ago? Here's another way that you can write categories. What is the difference from the previous category that we saw? That the method is no longer static. And also the receiver, is in the value of the annotation. But the behavior remains exactly the same. We have to make use of a category within a scope. But whether you want to write category using one convention or the other, well, now you know uh, you have choices. Do you recall what are the, um, the rules for creating an immutable class? If you follow Josh Block's effective Java, there are like seven or eight rules which happen to be recursive. Now, 
If you don't recall all those rules, it's okay. In Groovy, you just apply one line, the Groovy transform immutable, and you get the implementation of all those rules, pretty much. Now notice that we have three instances of point. Instances one and two have the same values. So we expect them to be equal because they are immutable. And instance number three has a different value for y. So we expect them to be different. And uh, if you were to run this in a Groovy shell or a Groovy console, then you will see that everything runs fine. If we change the last assertion to be equals equals, then we get an assertion error because these two things are different. You ever had trouble implementing the comparable interface? Supplied sortable. And this also adds additional methods such as compare by ID or comparator by ID, not just the proper implementation of compare to. As a matter of fact, if you were to do a search on the Groovy core libraries, you will find more than 70% ASC transformations already implemented. And based on some of these numbers or so on, uh, on these names and some of the behavior that we saw just recently, you might be thinking, Andreas, uh, these transformations remind me a lot of Project Lombok. That's actually true. The early ASD transformations from Groovy were inspired by Project Lombok, and then we added more. And so happens that Project Lombok saw what we were doing in Groovy, and they added transformations that were similar. So this was a little bit of cross-pollination within the, uh, the two projects. So why do I bring Project Lombok here? It's not just because they are similar, it's because in Groovy 4, we are prototyping yet another local AC transformation called POJU. It will work with a subset of the local transformations such as immutable and canonical in such a way that you can write POJO classes in Groovy and the generated bytecode will not contain any reference to the Groovy library. In a sense, you will use or you could use the add POJO transformation as a different version of Project Lombok, which receives a lot of hate because it changes bytecode. Well, I am actually on team Lombok in the sense that I love Lombok. And uh, so I'm also on team Groovy because I love the Groovy. And uh, if you could use project, uh, I, the, the POJO annotation instead of project Lombok and generate everything that we saw earlier with, with a concise uh, language, well, that's an option that you will have in the future. It's up to you to decide if you want to take it on. So finally, let's look at the global list transformations. These transformations are always enabled. They, as long as they're in the class path, they will always apply to your code. And these transformations require another um, resource similar to what we saw in the uh, extension modules. So there is one additional file that goes into the meta inf directory. The name of the file will also change in Groovy forward, so we have to aware of that. And uh, the way that you implement transformations, well, again, you have to be aware of compiler APIs. What is an expression? What is statement, class node, method node, property node, a few other things. But if you want, you can also use something called AST Builder that allows you to create expressions on three modes. You can pass plain text. We have multi-line text uh, in Groovy since forever. So you can use that or you can pass example code or can, you can use something that is very similar to Builder. You can also use macro methods, which was added to the language uh, thing that five or six years ago that simplified expressions. And in any case, you can always refer to the core AC transformations for how to implement your own transformations. I want to say something about macro methods, the most recent addition to metaprogramming. So there is one thing called a macro method and the content, the code of that method will, be, uh, will give you back the AST nodes that you want. So you, once you grab those nodes, you can pass it directly to the AST, to your implementation. But this is only for statements or expressions. If you want to generate methods, you use the macro class. If you want to have your own version of a macro method, you can use the <laughs> at macro AST transformation to do so. As a matter of fact, the macro method that you always have all, uh, access to is implemented using the at macro AST transformation. Do you want to know more about transformations? Also have a look at Spock framework. It is seen as one big AST transformation. It performs a lot of messaging to the ASTs. So this is another great place to start with. I leave you with a few resources. The first link is a detailed 
description of all metaprogramming aspects that we have in Groovy, but dynamic and runtime and static and compile time. It contains a list of all local, all global categories, mixing, trace, extension methods, macros, everything that we saw today plus more. There is a presentation by Paul King, the career PMC of Apache uh, Groovy. And uh, in this presentation, he goes further into how to implement your own SD transformations. And the history of the Groovy programming language can show you the evolution of the language as it's been through the years, the SD framework being one of them. So I'm almost done with, uh, with this. And uh, of course, everything we saw today is open source. You can contribute to open source very easily. You find something that is not working properly what we saw today or any other library, open a ticket. That's it. If you have the time, you want to uh, have the passion, you can send some code if you want to, but at the very least, open a ticket. And that is uh, pretty much it. So thank you very much for listening. I hope that you find uh, Groovy metaprogramming options to be of interest to you. Now you know that you have two choices and uh, well, let me know if you find this interesting. I'm very, very happy to follow through.